time chains, already using negative numbers to create a model for the grids comparing on the right hand side of the positive coefficients. If I change one of my signs, then I have the equation x squared minus 2x plus 2 equals 0. Then you see that this completing the square gives a slightly different equation. x minus 1 squared equals minus 1. And people who are attached to real life know that if you have the whole pictures, this parabola obviously has two real roots. But this parabola, which is x minus 1 squared plus 1, the picture is like this. And obviously, there are no values of x to which you have equality. So some people say there are no roots. But you have just seen Valerio in 19th century mathematics, and actually there is a root square root minus 1. And there's a different notation. You just say, well, I just define the number i, and the i stands for imaginary, meaning it doesn't really exist only in your brain, in your mathematician. So you can define whatever you like. <laughs> and you say, OK, there may not be a solution in real life. I define the number i to have square minus 1. That's a great idea. So if you see two centuries later, people do complex analysis great topic and solves many real world equations. But formally, what I'm doing solving the equation is a bit weird, right? I just introduce a notation. This is a square root sign, which is useful also in this case, in a different square root. Here I just call it i, i squared equals minus 1. And in that sense, solving it is easy. You just give a name to the root and you call it the root alpha. And yesterday there was actually a lecture, I think by Francesco, where you were told that you can always solve an equation and what can you do? I have this funny stem field, I think. Nobody uses the word stem field except for Bill and Francesco, I think. Feel free to use it. <laughs> what he does is that, well, if you want to solve an equation, what you do, you take a step and you form an extension field. I think you take your f to reduce all for simplicity, so for practical purposes, you can take your f in f of x some kind of reduced polynomial. And then you form a field by taking the polynomial ring f of x, and you mod out by all multiple polynomial f. So this is already some abstract algebra, this is ring theory. You take the polynomial ring, all multiples of f, therefore the ideal in that ring is the quotient ring, your f is reducible, happens to be a field. So this is a field, and in this field, there is an element, if you take the variable x, and you take it mod f, then by definition, in this field, this element, if you evaluate it in f, you get f of x, and that's exactly what you find here, that is zero, by definition. So this is an algebraic trick to achieve the fact that if you call this alpha, then by definition, f of alpha is zero, and you see that there is a field, namely f extension f alpha, and in here alpha is a root of f. And you can wonder, did we solve the equation? This is just algebraic manipulation. Yeah, you can say, if you find something, a quotient, the ring, you say, it's actually a field, in there is an element, but by definition is a root. If you, if you talk to a mathematician a few centuries ago, Giving such a solution to solving the equation, you would think to say this is nonsense, abstract nonsense. You didn't solve it. I want to see an actual solution. This is a solution. Square root 3, I can approximate. It's a real number. These are two real numbers. That is solving it. This is just all great nonsense. Okay, that's a somewhat old fashioned point of view. And I hope that by the end of next week, you will get a feeling that actually this algebraic approach does have some uh, merit in solving problems. So the true existence of solutions, probably you were then thinking, are there actual, say, complex numbers? So assuming that you are happy with the square root of minus 1, then you know that once in your life, you can need to extend the real numbers that everybody knows about, even though defining them mathematically is so simple. If you enjoy, as I did before, the square root of minus 1, <coughs> which means that you take the number in R dash, mod out by the producer for number x squared plus 1, which obviously has no real zeros. Then you get a field 
in which for all the left and the root, and the root is called i, and this field is by definition the field of all the numbers. And after having listened to Valerio, you have the feeling that these complex numbers are almost as real as the real numbers, but they do have square root minus one. Okay, so we've got complex numbers, so then maybe the question is, does your polynomial have a root in complex numbers? It only makes sense, of course, if you think f is contained in the real in the complex numbers. So typically for us, <coughs> f may be the rational number field. And then you have an interesting question if I write down the equation. So for instance, let me take f equal to, well, an easy example. Just replace the square by the cube, right? It's cube by the cube. Again, you would say, solving it, the old-fashioned way that you replace the square root by a cube root. There's only a single one. So you would say, well, of course, this x is going to be a cube root of 2. Again, it's solving the equation by just attaching a symbol, cube root of 2 to the root, which by definition is a real number having a cube root equal to 2. Whether it exists, well, the program say, well, cubes, x, y, x, cube root like this. Here is the cube root of 2. The point that the picture says it exists. And that's what you can approximate by taking some numerical analysis. If I change it a little bit, if I take f equal to x cubed, just the same what it did there. Just introduce a linear factor. Minus 6x minus 2. You can still ask, can you actually find the solutions? And if you draw this cubic, you will see that in 0 it's negative, and in 1 it's the list, and it gets positive again. So apparently this looks good. The picture is like this. This is a cubic, and something like this. So obviously, I hope this is good. No, it's wrong. Sorry. Almost right. It looks almost like this. This left. You see it has three real roots. And what does it mean to actually find them? So now the question is how do you solve the equation? You say, okay, stare at the picture, there's three real numbers to which you have roots. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, you can do this, I guess. This is uh, high school math, graph, open graphs. There are three real solutions. Can we find them? What will the notation be? And in general, if you have such an equation, there's only one root. This one has three real roots. You know what complex numbers, it actually does have three complex roots. There's this fundamental theorem about the complex numbers, it was called the fundamental theorem of algebra a ago, but actually the fundamental theorem of algebra. If you the algebraic theorem, it uh, uses properties of the real numbers that are not algebraic, but it says if you take any polynomial f with complex coefficients, any complex coefficient, so for instance, like this one. Now you've got to really go to hear what I'm saying. All the way in the back. Yes? yes. Now it's much better, right? Yes. Uh, where would we be without technology? Okay. <laughs> if you get deaf, sorry.
Two vertical? Yes. Okay. It's just me, I think. All right. So then the question is, if there's such a theorem, what does it imply for an actual polynomial? Where are these three real roots? How can you describe them? And just giving them a name called an alpha 1 and alpha 3, that doesn't feel like a solution, right? So let's step back a little bit and do old-fashioned algebra. If I say old-fashioned, I mean truly old-fashioned. It's uh, Italian algebra from the Renaissance. And in those days, if you would do something that went beyond what the Greeks already had done, that was truly exceptional. And one of the first exceptional cases was solving the cubic equation. But let me show you how to do this. And we're going to understand later in this course how this actually works. Now it just starts as a trick. And let me just first, before I do the cubic, remind you of the thing that everybody learns in high school. Maybe in the quadratic case, the one I just erased, there's always a solution. If you have a quadratic polynomial, x squared, and let me write it like this, ax plus b, the theorem says, so that's an example, over the complex numbers, there's always two complex roots, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And just like the theorem of Pythagoras, this is a formula that everybody knows, namely one of the roots of the quadratic equation, alpha 1, alpha 2. How do you find them? If you, or what I did in the special case with a is 2 and b is minus 2, you split up the square, you discover that the two roots are a over 2 plus or minus the square root of the thing, which is called the discriminant of the quadratic polynomial, which in my case is a squared minus 4b. And if a squared minus 4b may be negative, then the roots are actually complex numbers that are non-real. So you see that solving a quadratic equation is always easy if you allow the use of a square root sign. You can always do it. And the question is, can you do something similar for the cubic? The Greeks were unable to do it sometimes. It's, it's possible, like here. But in this case, it seems to be pretty hard. And what you need to do is to express the roots in terms of the coefficients. And you see that the, if you just work it out, that the a and the v are the sum and the product of the roots. So the a is alpha 1 plus alpha 2, that's why they put a minus sign, and the b is the product alpha 1 times alpha 2. So if you know the sum and the product of two numbers, you can actually find the numbers, the roots of a quadratic equation. And that's all you need to solve the cubic equation if you're sufficiently clever. And this clever guy was an Italian from, I think, 1500, who said, well, in order to solve the equation x cubed minus 6x minus 2, it's just an example, there is a trick. And of course, if you're a mathematician, you don't like tricks. You admire people who invent tricks. Then you want to understand it and discuss about it long. And after a couple of weeks, you say, ah, actually, it is trivial. Then you're a mathematician. It means you understood the trick. And the trick in this case is that you replace your x and say, let put x is going to be u plus v. It doesn't look like an improvement. Now you have two variables instead of one. But in this case, it's actually quite effective as long as you know how to cube a sum of two things. That's Newton's binomium, right? So you need to compute u plus v cubed minus 6 times u plus v minus 2 equals 0. That's the equation to be solved. And if you, you know that it's not equal to u cubed plus v cubed, right? That distinguishes you from the non-mathematicians. There are these intermediate terms. And if you think about it, that's the, that's the 3 u v. If you put in the minus 6, I just write it in an intelligent way. u plus v minus 2 equals 0. Yeah, so the 3 u v times the u plus v takes care of the 3 u squared v, 3 u v squared. It has to be in the middle here. And the minus 6 is done there. And that's the equation. And what do you do now? You say, well, this has to be 0. And initially, it was just 1x. Now we have two variables. So what are you going to do? I first kill this part by making this equal to 0. And when does that happen? Well, then u v has to be equal to 2, as you see. So I make sure that I do take my u and v in such a way that u times v equals 2. But actually, now I'm back to one variable. Since v is just 
2 over u. And then I want u cubed plus v cubed to be equal to 2. So I need to solve u cubed plus v cubed equals 2. And uv also has to be equal to 2. And I say, well, that's two equations with two unknowns. But if I cube this equation, u cubed, v cubed, I get 2 cubed, which is 8. And then I have two numbers, u cubed and v cubed, for which I know both the sum and the product. So that means that the quadratic polynomial with roots u cubed and v cubed, I know what it is, since these two roots they have sum 2, so it starts y squared minus 2, y, plus the product, and the product is 8. So you see that u cubed and v cubed are roots of a quadratic polynomial. And that's something we know how to solve, right? Namely, that's just a formula behind my back, and you see that y is 1 plus or minus the square root of, what is it? 4 minus 32, that's minus 28. And, oh, wasn't there a half somewhere that got lost? Why don't you guys ever tell me? <laughs> this is Asia. <laughs> I think this guy is a professor. He must know what he's writing, right? <laughs> but all these professors, they're just human beings, so they may just have a slip or whatever. Good. Thank you for reminding me. So next time you say right away, isn't there a hand lagging? Like sure. Good. And if you do this, then you see that this y is going to be 1 plus or minus a half square root minus 28. Which is the same thing as 1 plus or minus the square root of minus 7. So you see we've solved the equation, namely y is u plus v and u and v, u cubed and v cubed are these two qualities. So here's a nice solution. x is going to be the cube root of 1 plus the square root of minus 7 plus the cube root of 1 minus, sorry, square root of minus 7. So, this is the radical solution by radicals of the equation. And now we're really confused since we did something very intelligent. This is the Cardano del Ferro formula, as it's called. It's from the 16th century. And you see that even though the picture clearly shows us three real roots, we have this solution. But it looks like it's a cube root of something which is not even real. So it is a real number. Okay, just being Asian, not even just not. Then you know you speak Asian. Okay, yes. <laughs> real number, yes or no? There's a picture that says it's real, and there's a formula that doesn't look like anything. So what's your preference? Left or right? Yeah. Not another question, right? That's the better one. Yeah. yeah. Any engineer would say there's a solution. This is just algebraic nonsense. But that's the aim of this course to show that this algebraic nonsense actually holds the key to much more. So. First of all, why are there actually three roots here? That's because in the complex numbers, any complex number, if you take its cube root, there will be three of them. So this looks like a formula, but actually it has three values. Since any non-zero complex number has three different cube roots. And the other one is just two divided by that value. Yeah, because of the formula that you see here, that was here somewhere, yeah u, v, this is u, this is v. If I put u equal to something, then v is just u, 2 over u. So that's then 2 over that value. So there are actually three roots here, just by choosing the three cube roots there. And apparently, the result is going to be real. And you can imagine, if you were in Italian from the 16th century, this was, it was extremely complicated. It was the so-called irreducible case, since you get a solution by radicals, but it involves square roots of negative numbers. Why is this? This is something you want to understand if you're a mathematician. So that's one of the aims of this course. And the answer is given by Galois theory. That's why we chose Galois theory as this topic. Since the approach in this course 
will be started by Francesco already. Uh, the next lecture will be after that. Since getting these roots, <coughs> I just erased the stem field, the word I didn't want to use. You can adjoin whatever you like to create the roots in the field. And you know there's complex numbers. But this theorem is unalgebraic. It just says there exists complex numbers. You can approximate it. That's the numerical analysis part, the real solution from engineering. And there's an algebraic way of doing things which is different, which starts by adjoining roots as roots of irreducible polynomials. And apparently, if you want to understand the roots of this polynomial f, yeah, so we do know that there are three roots, alpha 1 up to alpha 3. And they are given by a funny formula that we don't understand yet. It just looks ugly. And what we're going to do, and Francesco is starting this, is that you just say, well, start from, say, the rational numbers, such as your ground field, and adjoin these three roots. That's an algebraic construction. You don't take all the complex numbers, or all the delete, or real, or whatever. This is an algebraic construction. Adjoin the three roots. This is called the splitting field, to be defined in an hour and a half from now. The splitting field of this polynomial that we call F. F over the rations. That's the algebraic construction to be explained. And we will see that you can do this in two parts. The first part where it was the stem field part, you just take one formal root you call it alpha 1. This is Qx modulo F. That's a cubic extension. The degree is 3 as a field extension. And we will see that you don't have all the roots in this field. You need to throw in alpha 2 and alpha 3. And in alpha 1 is already a root that's only quadratic, so there's an additional quadratic extension. We give you q alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. That's the splitting field. And the idea that goes back to Galois is that you can understand these extensions in terms of group theory. And that's the general setup. So to solve the equation fx equals 0, which means understanding the field extension containing all the roots, and that's a much smaller extension than the full complex numbers, that's an uncountable field, this will be a field extension of degree 6. And this degree 6 extension holds all the roots, and anything you want to know about is that polynomial can be answered in that smallish field of degree 6. So you need to understand finite field extensions. So for general f, what are we going to do? We're going to extend f to its splitting field, so f is the polynomial that we want to solve, whatever that means, to form the splitting field. This is the notation, I think, that, uh, that Francisco will be using. He just told me. Maybe it uh, also has a funny name, but I haven't read Milne yet, so maybe we're going to find out. Anyway, this is the splitting field. And we're going to look at a group, the Galois group of the polynomial f which has a definition. It consists of all automorphisms of this splitting field. So these are field automorphisms over the base field. So by definition, that is all sigma in the automorphism group of the field. I think, see, look at that. We'll see many examples later on with the property that if you do, do restrict them to f, you get the identity. And this group holds all the information about the polynomial f, as we will see. As you see, it depends on the polynomial, but only in terms of the associated splitting field. This is the associated Galois group. And we have finite group. And we can realize it explicitly, it will be acting on the roots of the polynomial. So that means if you can split your polynomial in terms of things that you call alpha 1 to alpha n, they will live inside the splitting field. Yeah? FF is the extension of F generated by the roots and the alpha i's are the roots of F. Now there's a technical detail. I'm not talking about technical detail. The second lecture by Intan will actually deal with technical details. For instance, if I take my F irreducible, which I usually will, of degree M, That would be nice 
that the n complex root that you have are actually different. You should not have multiple roots. So there's a technicality that you want your polynomial to be separable. And you can wonder whether irreducible polynomials like x cubed minus six x minus two, this is irreducible over the rationals. We're going to ask you why, but people who know a little bit about polynomials over the rationals say, yes, sure, that's the Isis number of the two. That's irreducible. And if you don't know that, you can check for yourself in other ways reducible. Can it have multiple roots? Well, if it's irreducible, that will never happen. Let's see if going to explain that. Irreducible polynomials over the rationals are always separable. In, sorry? No, oh, we're not going, not going into fever of my technology, right? It's not working. Please. <laughs> Right, so we just assume that these roots are actually distinct, that the polynomial will be separate. And leave it to the next lecture to show that usually irreducible polynomials are separable. Over the rationals they are, over the finite fields they are. Maybe Francesca will show us. But there are examples where, yeah, accidents happen and they can coincide. They have a, they have a problem. But if that's the case, the Galois group, that's a very abstract group. It's defined by automorphisms of the extension field over the ground field. You think, well, automorphism, that's a funny word. But actually, such an automorphism is just defined by what it does on the roots. And being the identity of f, it can only send roots to roots. So any automorphism is just a permutation to set the roots. So very explicitly, this finite group, you can view it as a subgroup of the symmetric group on n elements. And since we have this great proof by Bas Eindhoven that Whatever you call these n elements, alpha 1 to alpha n, or 0 to n minus 1, or 1 to n, it really doesn't matter. In my case, it's called alpha 1 to alpha n. This group is the permutation group on the roots. And any automorphism is characterized by what it does on the roots. So you get a subgroup of Sn. And this group holds, all, holds the key to understanding the polynomial. So we want to understand which subgroup you actually go to get. So it's a finite group. And among the theorems we will prove later this week <coughs> is there's various old results. So for instance, I just erased this very tricky proof of the cubic equation. And cubic equation can always be solved. And let me vaguely phrase a theorem for polynomials of degree, polynomials of degree at least 5 there is no general radical formula formula to find the roots so what we know already from high school for degree 2, which you can just, well, I always knew it, but except for the half, but most people know that there's a very easy formula for quadratic polynomials like this. The cubic one is more involved, it gives rise to complicated numbers, so they can be complex if your solutions are real. And there's an even more complicated one for degree 4, which also goes back to the Italians. So it's a very funny story. In those days, people would actually, there would be a journal to publish it, so you would just claim you could do it, you show it by examples, and try and be smarter than your colleagues. And they really got mad at each other. And who actually is credited with the solution in degree three and four? That's a whole story about. Uh, there are novels about it. You should read maybe someday. You don't have anything better to do. It's really funny. Um, <clears throat> but there were many disputes about who actually found those solutions. But for degree five and higher, it's impossible. Which is a bit weird, right? If you make it all the way up to four, why would it stop? And the reason is that there is a theorem from group theory that we also phrase for and at least five, the group Sn, which is the essential group that you need to solve equations, even though it's not yet clear in which way this is going to happen, the group Sn is not solvable. And of course, that theorem only makes sense to you if you know what solvable means for a group. Is that part of your? Probably not, right? OK, well, we'll define it the next time, or <coughs> one of the next times. There's an easy property of groups, which is called solvability or solubility if you're British, I think. And it's not too difficult to show that 
as n is solvable if n is at most 4, and apart from that, it doesn't happen. And that implies, by a mechanism that comes out of Galois theory, which is to be explained, that you will not find actual <coughs> radical formulas. Of course, you also have to say what you mean by a radical formula. Yeah, we have just have been looking at these formulas, and everybody is happy with the square root and the cube root. But we see, we've seen already for these cube roots, there are three of them in the complex numbers. If you start adding and multiplying such expressions, well, which choice do you make? Is the thing really well defined? Or is a cube or something, is it just a set of three elements? Or is it a unique complex number? Yeah, you have to be very precise, I would say just be a mathematician, to make sense of this. So, <clears throat> these results are going to be explained, and you see this is the power of group theory, and Galois, actually, what he did was inventing group theory, if you want, in a, at least finite groups, to apply them to polynomial equations. So, we should be able, by the end of next week, if you get home and you write down your favorite equation of degree 3 or 4 or maybe 5, just pick a random polynomial, and you come home and your mother asks you, so, <laughs> you learn about Galois groups, right? So what is the Galois group of this polynomial? And even those of you who already did Galois theory, and I'm told the people in the Philippines that do Galois theory already at a very young age, can they compute Galois groups? I don't know. We're going to find out. We'll have training sessions, so by the end of next week you can pick your favorite polynomial to use Galois group. And we will see that, for instance, the fact that for this polynomial, you get an extension of degree, of degree 6, so the field degree, in this example, of the splitting of the, the degree Q alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 over Q is equal to 6. And as it happens, the number of elements of the Galois group and the Galois group of this polynomial F is just the full permutation group. As I said, it was going to be a subgroup. It permutes the three roots, and in this case, it's just an isomorphism. This is a group which has order 6. And one of the statements of Galois theory is that if you form this group, it has a, it's a finite group, so there's a certain order, dividing and factorial. And that order is actually the degree of this field extension. So the Galois group already holds the non-trivial information what the degree of this extension is. You can wonder if you take your favorite degree n polynomial and join all the roots. In general, you will not get the full group as n. Which one is it? Yeah. <clears throat> so we still have time for one small example. <clears throat> this is a somewhat complicated example since the formula for the roots is too difficult to remember. Most people I know don't know the cardano Ferro formula by heart, unlike the quadratic formula that at least you knew by heart and I didn't. So, if I just look at x cubed minus 2, then you can adjoin a root, the stem field, huh? q, q root of 2, which is qx, modulo x cubed minus 2, that's a cubic extension. And how do we know that not all the roots are in this field? That's not to be obvious, right? And you really have to know your complex number a little bit to know that there are actually three roots of two. There's the standard real root. But in the complex numbers, you know that if you, <coughs> well, try and do it, it's like a little triangle. If you rotate it 120 degrees, there's another cube root of two. Yeah, I shouldn't call it cube root of 2, since that has the same name and it's different, as you know. But what you can do, if you know about the factorization of x cubed minus 1, the cube root of unity in the complex numbers, there's an interesting one. And there's two other ones, the root of x squared plus x plus 1. And you see that the roots of this polynomial are minus a half plus a minus a half square root. Minus 3. These are the two zeta 3, the cube root of unity, and it's squared. And this root, you can get it from the real one by multiplying it by the cube root of unity. Here's the other one, zeta 3 squared cube root of 2. 
And you see, to get all three roots, the real one is enough. You also need this zeta 3, this square root of minus 3 thing. So the conclusion at the end of the day is that in this case, the splitting field is going to be q, q plus 2, square root of minus 3, which indeed does have degree 6. It's something cubic and something quadratic on top of it. So here we have explicitly constructed the field. And it's way easier than in the previous example, but it's to the left of it. So in this case, you do get a Galois group, and <clears throat> the Galois group tells you the way the roots behave under symmetry. So you think of the Galois group as a symmetry group of the roots of the polynomial. And the theorem that it will prove, are not just these old theorems, but also the standard statement that many people may already know, that if you know the subgroups <coughs> of the Galois group, you know all the subfields. And in this case, you see there is a subfield, which is q squared minus 3. And it always happens, <coughs> or always happens, if your Galois group is S3, S3 has a subgroup, a cyclic group of order 3 of index 2, it will always correspond to a quadratic field. So, <coughs> in this particular case, there must be a similar field. And <coughs> so in this case, Q alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, the root of this polynomial is going to be of degree 6 over the rationals. And there will be a quadratic subfield. And even if what you're learning here may be too complicated to explain to your mother next week, she can just ask, what is that quadratic subfield? If you don't remember the cardano lefebvre formula, at least you can wonder, which one is it? So which people among you already learned about Galois theory? And you're from the Philippines, you see? That confirms my theorem. Sorry, it was not a theorem, it was a um, social observation. So, <laughs> so what's the correct subfield? How would you find it? Now I hope that the Philippines will say, oh sorry, yeah, we didn't do that in the Philippines. We still have something to learn here this week. And I see that my time is up. That's a bit amazing, but it doesn't really matter. This is just an introduction, and the real work will be done by Intam starting next week. Thank you.